I, it's on now. Are you all hearing, hearing me okay? <laughs> um, Ambassador White uh, had really an extraordinary career. Um, began in the Peace Corps. Um, I think it would be fair to say that uh, she grew up professionally in the development community, working for the U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, which is, um, offers a set of experience, uh, experiences a little different from um, um, those that, that we in other parts of the foreign affairs bureaucracy uh, live. Um, uh, she, at, at various times, um, worked in Mali, uh, Tanzania, Liberia, I'm forgetting some. Oh, yeah, lots. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, lots of countries in Africa. But uh, I, was, I was head of Africa. AID in those three countries, and, and then uh, the Gambia. And then was, um, was selected as the U.S. ambassador to Haiti. Um, she was there um, for, during a difficult time, but um, virtually um, every time in the last 30 years has been difficult. Most recently, um, and, and this is part of the reason why um, we reached out to Ambassador White and, um, and, and, and basically demanded that she come talk to us <laughs> here. Uh, uh, she was one of the, the first American diplomats to say, um, folks, enough is enough. We're going to have to do something to help Haiti. Um, and she's going to, to give us um, some specifics on just how difficult things are in Haiti right now. But it gives you an idea that they have had in the last couple of years a presidential assassination, major earthquake, and they have been hit um, by a, a severe hurricane. As of a few weeks ago, um, there were a number of reports that said there are no longer any legitimately elected officials still in power in the country, and 60% of the country is controlled by criminal gangs. So um, it's, it's a very difficult uh, environment. I've also spent a lot of time there, different periods from, uh, from Ambassador White, and I can tell you that every single time I, I visited, and it was always in an official capacity, um, I was shocked by the conditions and, um, and appalled that, that we, we seemed never to have been able to, to move the country definitively forward. In any event, it's a great pleasure to have Ambassador <laughs> White here. Um, uh, she's still extraordinarily active. We're just talking downstairs. But one of her, her recent talks out in Colorado she works with Bowdoin College in Maine, as well as the University of Southern Maine. No, University of Maine in Orono. Uh, University of Maine yeah. in Orono. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, her, um, for me, somewhat surprising, but altogether welcome recent public comment that we needed to, to get serious about Haiti. Um, I think originally ran in a little newspaper in Maine, but very quickly ricocheted <laughs> all over the country. So with, uh, w without any further uh, preamble, Ambassador White. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here, really thrilled. Yesterday. I'm going to add one thing. Yes. We're both originally from Maine. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, is kind really of important. unusual. Uh, yeah, born and bred in Maine. But uh, I had a uh, fast tour of the campus yesterday, and I, I must say, I just fell in love with the place. It's beautiful and exciting and architecturally fascinating, so I'm so glad I came. Even the weather uh, was nice yesterday, so I pulled that up. I'm going to quickly go through some slides, because I wanted you to kind of have something to absorb, but I think it's sometimes easier. I'm going to do it quickly, though, because uh, Ambassador Duddy, uh, Professor, uh, asked me to keep it short so we have a time for questions. But just as a little tiny bit, my first experience in Haiti was in 1986 to 1991. So I spent five years in Haiti at a junior level, actually. It was my first tour as a FSO, the Foreign Service Officer, was in Haiti. Not my first tour. I was a contractor for AID before that, but that was when I became officially an FSO. And uh, sort of got to know all the family. So, I mean, I know the private sector. I know 
the, the political sector. I know uh, who's, uh, I know the names of the biggest gangs. I mean, they really haven't changed much <laughs> since my first tour many, many, many years ago. And how Haiti looks today is much worse than it looked when I was there, and I got there two years after the earthquake. So I'm not saying much for good old Haiti, who I, which I love, who, what. with that button right there? The one that doesn't say, okay, great. I don't, that's a horrible old picture of me, so I'll get rid of that. Okay, uh, <laughs> I used to, uh, I, when I was in Haiti, I would often say this expression, Haiti's too rich to be poor, because of the rich traditions in the country. They're some of the most wonderful painters and basket weavers and sculptors in the world and a uh, tradition of being the first free black republic from 1804. So they have, they're very proud of their history, and it's a very rich history. And why we can't do it right together, because they're very industrious people, escapes me to this day. But I do know that we need to work with the Haitian people because they are worth saving. I'm going to just do uh, a fact. This is a good, uh, quick overview of the presentation. I don't, don't need to spend much time on it. I'm going to give you some facts and fi figures, a brief recent history, because I can't go back to 1804 and still be here, uh, get out of here in 20 minutes, of what's going on now and maybe some hope for the future. So I, I'm going to just, I know you can read this, but it's worth uh, me reading with you. 217,000 people suffer from malnutrition. That's of today. 22% of the children under five are stunted. 66% of the children suffer from anemia. Six million of 12 million people are below the poverty level. 2.5 million live on less than a dollar, around a dollar a day. And five million, five million people right this minute are on the verge of starvation. Um, the, the, this is, you know, in a real nutshell, but in 2010, there was a major, major earthquake. I got there as ambassador in 2012, and believe me, we had lots and lots of work to do then. But it's hard to imagine, it's, it's hard for me to put into words what 280,000 dead people look like. We're not talking about 280,000 people over 10 years. We're not talking about 3,000 people that get killed in New York. We're talking about 280,000 people dead in less than five minutes. It is inconceivable for a human to understand what that looks like. And I was brought, I was mission director for AID in Liberia at the time of the earthquake in 2010, and I was brought into Washington to run the control center at USAID. So I had millions and millions and millions of dollars, and every NGO and the military and every... Um, everybody else helping out in the, in the post right right after the earthquake, earthquake in 2010. And let me tell you, we did everything that we could to help, but the need was unbelievable. Everything was wiped out. The airport, the ports, the roads, the, the universities, the parliament building, gone, gone, gone. And then, as if that wasn't bad enough, and they were just starting to get their act together a little bit over the 2010 um, horror show when 2016 came and put 200,000 uh, homeless again. We had cleaned up uh, some of the tent cities that were erected right after the earthquake of 2010, but most of that was gone, completely gone by 2000. Uh, when I left, by 2015, pretty much all gone, and then right back again uh, in 2016. And then 2021 was the worst year ever uh, for Haiti. They had, they had some really bad And they had some really bad years. They had a 7.2 mag uh, earthquake in the south, and it may, the, in the south, which is beautiful part of Haiti, because of the gangs were almost impossible to get anything, any supplies from the capital city where the big port is to the south. The gangs were demanding money to put down medicine or supplies or food or anything else. Uh, it was bad enough. There were thousands dead, two billion dollars worth of damage, and then their president in June of 2021 got assassinated. So not a good year for Haiti. Uh, the poverty rate there is 58 percent, so 60 percent of the population, like I told you, three quarters of the country is lacking any kind of water, and it's gotten worse. It gets worse every day. 
kidnappings happen every day. When I got to Haiti, um, they had about three kidnappings a month in 2012. By the end time I left in 2015, there was one a month. Uh, the national police were very well trained by American policemen, and they were doing a great job. Now, it's over the, uh, over the last weekend, there was something like 18 people kidnapped. So it's horrible. And murders, daily basis. Everyone that I know, and I still have many, many friends in Haiti, everybody I know has had somebody that a close friend, a family member assassinated in Haiti in the last two years. Okay, I'm going to give you a recent history because it's important that you know just what all of this is built on. It, 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 this all just didn't happen in one ugly day or even one ugly earthquake. It's been building for a long, long time. And if you look at Haiti's whole history, ancient history, not recent history, you will see that it is plagued by violence, by people being hung, people being put into uh, into palaces, into rooms and locked and letting them just suffocate in there. I mean, ugly, long-term, violent uh, history in Haiti. And it didn't get any better when the famous, infamous Papa Doc ruled from 1954 to 1971. He was a monster. He dressed all in black. He pretended he was a voodoo figure. He would twice a year go into the streets and pass out money. Um, he used Vu uh, as uh, you know as his uh, strong point. He used it to scare people, and they did. They worshipped whatever he was, and whatever he was was evil. He would kill whole families in the middle of the night, and that was the Tonton Makut. The Tum they didn't have a military, didn't need a military, they didn't have a police force, didn't need a police force because they had the Tonton Makut, and they ran Haiti with an evil, strong hand. And then his idiot... Uh, son, Baby Doc, who I personally have met many, many times, never met uh, uh, Papa, but uh, Baby. And Baby Doc came to power. He was 18 years old when he took over. He had no college. He'd been off the island once in his entire life. He was married to a very intelligent, college-educated Michelle, who pretty much answered all the questions if he was in an interview. She was like, what, what do you th see as the, uh, the future of education in Haiti? And he'd say, um, I don't know, Michelle. And Michelle would answer the question. That's how it was in almost any uh, talk that he gave for the years that he was in power. And then when I was there, the United States government and all the other governments, especially France, decided enough of baby doc. He was too... Mm, Numb, and he still had the Tonto Makuts hanging around. Let's get rid of Baby Doc. And here's what happened that I think is worth knowing, because I knew the ambassador, Ambassador Adams, very well. Al Adams, uh, great, great ambassador, and he, um, he they, they took him out at midnight. Al Adams, the Ambassador Adams, was in the car when they took him to the airport to take him to France. And the next day, all hell broke loose. I mean, rocks were being thrown, tires, tires were being burned all over the city. And uh, Ambassador Adams came, that, that, not that day, but a couple of days following, and he said, all right, everybody, now we have to um, organize elections. And I, even though as a junior officer, always a little mouthy, even as a junior officer, I said, Ambassador Adams, how are we going to organize elections? There's no po political parties, there's no parliament, there's no judicial system there's no there's nothing it's been a dictatorship since 1954 uh when baby doc uh, pepper doc took over and he said the, the haitian people deserve elections pam and we're going to give them election and i'm like ah, better better be quiet while i'm ahead but years and years later when i was a student at the national war college he came in um and talked to everybody and he, we had lunch afterwards and he said i should have listened to you uh elections were a pretty bad idea because uh, we didn't have any of the the stepping stones, the foundation that would have allowed us to have decent elections. Um, and so 1987, 1988, um, they, the first elections that, and I was there for that, were aborted. The middle of, we, we had all the teams in from Washington, election observers. We had hundreds of people hanging around, ready to go, and the shots start firing down. They, they were running around in cars and standing up outside of the roofs, shooting, 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 shooting. So everyone went... Um, you know, went, went back quickly inside the hotels or wherever they were staying and hunkered down. Uh, and then, you know, we managed to get everything started again. And then, um, that, so the, after, this, after this mess of the cars running around shooting everybody, they put a general, 
So the General Avril was a pretty good guy in lots of ways and not without some kind of intelligence, but he had zero international experience and he had zero experience as a, as a leader, as a, except as a military leader. And the, the generals in Haiti tend to be self-appointed generals. They buy their stripes online or wherever they can get them or when they're in Miami, you can pick these things up fairly easily. So in general, General Avril always had lots of these things, but uh, he wasn't particularly... Um, but popular, and then the first president, uh, democratically elected president uh, for the country, was elected in 1990 and took po po power in 1991. President Aristide. Uh, president Aristide was a priest. He was a incredibly uh, smart, uh, great with people. He went across the entire country when he was elected with just a, a horn, saying you know, and speaking in Creole. Never spoke a word of French. Uh, and talking to the Haitian people, and they loved him, and they came out in big numbers. And so he was elected with 67% 60 uh, of the population. That was the last time, really, that any president uh, came out with any big uh, portion of the population. And he was not a good president, in my opinion. A lot of people thought he was, uh, because he didn't know anything about international finance. He didn't know anything about international negotiations. He did not deal with the ambassadors that were around. He mistrusted anybody that wasn't Haitian, anybody that didn't speak Creole. And so he had his own little kingdom there. Like I said, it wasn't like he was not without intelligence, but he was out without any real experience. And so he was there in 1991. He got into office, and then he was um, he was forced to resign. And then there was all kinds of bad goings on, and he came back again uh, in, in 1992, 14,000 refugees from Cuba. And this made the United States very, very nervous, so we paid much more attention to Haiti than we normally did. Uh, after Bush then said no more immigrants, and this set off a whole, uh, you know, uh, wide spread, uh, and, and almost anything sets off widespread tire burning in Haiti, but this one was even worse, and they, uh, they did not like the United States very much during this period. Anyway, um, in 1994, the United States uh, said, all right, Aristide, you go back. He was flown in. Chaos was everywhere. You know, was he the real president? Wasn't he the real president? He had his really strong followers. And about this time, you started hearing a lot of gangs being... Um, controlled by the, the president, by the, by the private sector, and the president and the gangs were all kind of getting intertwined here, and everyone was paying each other to stay on their sides. And it, it, we got lots of uh, super uh, uh, classified cables about the gang movement. That's really, really started big time back in that, about, about that time. And then in 1996, a guy named Preval was elected president. He was an Aristide lover, best friends. They were both in the same party, political party. By the way, there's about, I don't know, 30 political parties. There's only two or three really big ones. But they're, when, they, when it's time for election, the number of people running for election is a list this long. Um, anyway, uh, Preval came over. Preval was a businessman. Uh, he had studied uh, somewhat in the United States. He also uh, was fairly intelligent, but again, was not certainly anyone that was a big player in the international uh, role. But he did, um, he did uh, wine and dine every ambassador, mostly to try to get money out of them, which he was pretty successful at doing, actually. And then Aristide was elected, so they, they sort of to they tossed the president's... Um, ball back and forth. And Haiti, you can be president for five years, but you cannot be president for the next five years. You have to take a break. So that's what they did with each other. Aristide was in, Preval, then he was out, then Preval was in, then he was out. So that went back and forth. And then uh, in 2006, Preval won again. He had 51% of the votes. You can see this is going down, but still, you know, oh, you know, acceptable. At least he had a mandate. But, uh, I mean, nothing was particularly stable in Haiti like it never is because there's not enough really uh, jobs and income and taxes, et cetera, et cetera, to keep everybody calm. But it, it, was, it was a pretty good period until the earthquake hit. And Preval was not... Um, was not prepared for this. No, I no, no one was prepared for this earthquake. And the and the amount of worldwide attention on Haiti, people were flying in from all over the world. Money was flying in from all over the world. 
teams of doctors. I mean, they were everywhere. The embassy grounds were completely covered by volunteers that flew in and had no place to stay. Hotels were beyond, most of them were ruined, but the ones that weren't ruined uh, were dysfunctional. And so people were swarming everywhere. It was fairly disorganized, to tell you the truth, even though there was huge amounts of money. And Preval was not a guy that really had his hands, could get his hands around all of this uh, organization and money and um, prioritiz prioritization. So the UN took all, over a lot of that prioritization, as did the donors, and I don't think they did a particularly good job of donor coordination, which they don't do in many uh, places in the world. And then, the, so the earthquake hits, billions of dollars start flowing in, and then in 2011, just before I got there, a guy named Michel Martelli becomes president. Michel Martelli, who was, is, what was and is, uh, an incredibly charming uh, entertainer. I mean, he sings, he sings, he can play four or five instruments, he's entertaining. He's literally an entertainer. Yeah, he's literally an entertainer. Yeah. He's an entertainer that often took his pants down at the end of a show just to cause a little excitement. Uh, he would wear bras for, uh, for whatever reason. I'm not sure. He's not even sure. I, I asked him about that one. I'm like, well, you know, President Martelli, what about the bras? Oh, Pamela, 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 I don't know. Like, okay, I mean, he was a colorful, is a colorful personality. And the Haitian people tended to love him because he went into any crowd and he would sing to them and he would preach to them and he would talk to them like he was their father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, you know, I would say that well over half the population really, really liked him and the other half really, really didn't. But again, no international experience. He never graduated from college. Got kicked out of at least five or six different schools, of which he was sort of bra would brag about from time to time. But in any case, he stayed around. And corruption, corruption, corruption was every, everywhere. His brother-in-law was one of the big drug dealers and Kiko, and it still is. But in any case, um, he stayed until 2017 uh, when he finally agreed uh, to go. And then Moise, they had to run two elections before actually he was declared a winner. Uh, but he only won 22, only 22 percent of the people even voted. And only half of those, so 10 percent of the population voted for Moise. So he had no real power. He had no authority. And from the very beginning, he was very controversial. And then he became very isolated. He would not meet with the core group, which were all the, the core ambassadors, the French, the Germans, the United States, et cetera. And so then in 20, June of 2021, bingo, Moise gets assassinated, and nobody, 30, 25, 30 um, Colombians, they'd say, I don't know, some were, uh, went into his house and gunned him down, and they gunned his wife down, although she did survive. And to this day, although the FBI says they've been down there, and the CIA says they've been down there, and God knows who else, uh, there's really no trace, there's no leads on who killed President Moore. So today, this is what polarization defines politics down there. No group, no one group yet has gotten together that represents all the different, the, the private sector, these, these, uh, these powerful political parties. Every, every time they think they've got everyone at the table, one of them, one of the real keys drops out. So it's, that's a mess. They had something called the Montana Group that had almost everybody. Uh, in uh, uh, sitting at the table, and then Aristide's party, which is huge in Haiti, dropped out, and then Tet Calais, the, the and Martelli's party, then they dropped out, so neither one of them are around anymore. And what the Montana group was was um, was saying should be done is a transitional two-year government. At the end of the two years, they would have elections, and it all sounded pretty good on paper, but no one was quite sure how it was going to work in reality, because the people that they were that they were saying should be part of the transitional government with the same old names that we had been hearing, uh, the political names for a long time in Haiti. There wasn't really any new blood, and people were very afraid that the old corrupt circles would be uh, again in power. And Henri, who is the prime minister that was sworn in after uh, Moise was assassinated, so he's really not legit either, he says that he's going to uh, give, um, he's going to uh, organize elections. He gave a speech on December 21st that he's going to uh, organize election in 2024, which I can guarantee you a thousand percent is not going to happen. Uh, all 10 senators, there were 10 senators left uh, of the government, and they all left last month, this month, January 2023. So now there's nobody. There's no 
chance of elections because there's no national ID office, there's no uh, central organizing um, group. They've nominated two or three people, but it's not, it's not going to happen, believe me. Uh, and then as, as if they weren't having enough fun in 2021 and 22, the cholera reemerged. Uh, cholera, they had been cholera free for about five years after the, they had a huge cholera outbreak while I was there. It was caused by the UN troops that had passed it on to the population. They had never had cholera before. The UN agreed that it was their fault, but they, they couldn't get enough money to really fund uh, any uh, campaign. But the country did get, become cholera free. Now it's rampaging. Uh, the chief doctor, who's a very good friend of mine, um, Jean Pop, uh, I t- spoke with him yesterday and he said there's about 25,000 people afflicted with it today and it's spreading like crazy. Uh, it's not so much in Port au Prince because they got that, they got enough um, uh, medicine distributed, but it's everywhere else in the country and it's going to be a real killer. Gangs control 60%. Haitian National Police, which when I was there, was doing a hell of a job with. Uh, making sure uh, drugs were under control and kidnappings were under control are in tatters. They don't have enough uh, enough numbers. They don't have enough equipment. They don't have enough training, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Kidnapping most in the world and probably um, murders most in the world. This morning, um, Ambassador was telling me that the two cities that are most um, – the two countries that have the most uh, um, murderous or dangerous capital cities of Venezuela where he served and uh, Port-au-Prince and, and Haiti where I served, so – in, we're in good uh, company. So security, in my opinion, is the number one uh, consideration. That if we can't solve the security, when it, that you can't go out in the street. People can't open their stores. Banks are closed. Schools are closed. If we can't get the security situation under control, I, in my opinion, nothing else is going to work. Governance, there is none. Let's face facts. Uh, high unemployment, of course, is high unemployment. The gangs are taking up anybody. And but if they, if somebody pays you a buck a day in Haiti, they'll do almost anything you say, and they are. And that now, so being employed by the gangs is now the number one employer of choice, or maybe not choice, but it's there. So cholera, elections, murder of Maurice, uh, now immigration. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago, uh, 379 p- people were uh, found off the coast of Haiti. Um, they did not drown, but they were about to. So it, this is a, a huge immigration crisis is coming. So here are my options. Um, yesterday there was a hearing at the United Nations, and they spoke of many of these options, but no one seems to be doing anything. My opinion, not doing anything is is killing children, killing innocent Haitians. You've got to do something, United States of America and the world. So uh, my thing, my biggest, um, not my biggest, but I think my strongest recommendation about security is send in a, a group, I think somewhere between 200 and 1,000 U.S. either military or trained policemen. We had that's what we did when I was there. We had about 300 um, uh, working, uh, but of Haitian descent, uh, policemen from Miami and New York City. They came in and they worked with the national police. They trained them. We had, we had, we gave them about I would say 10 million dollars a year, and we trained them. And we gave, we equipped them, and we made sure that they didn't go off the deep end. We had eyes on them all the time. We trained them how to use dog, uh, dogs at the airport. I mean, they were really pretty professional when I left, and I was very proud of of the role that we had played. But it's all disintegrated. Uh, when Trump came over, he took away the ten million and said, "We don't want to do that with our money," and it's just down in the hole. But I think. That, they do not want an occupation like they did for years with the UN or the Marines were in there for 20 years. We don't, they don't want an occupation. I don't think an occupation is necessary. I think what is needed is a really well armed and trained force that goes in there and gets control of the streets of Haiti. And I don't think anything else is more important than that. Governance, who's going to run Haiti? How are we ever going to get to an election? In my opinion, we have to do a transition. We have to put people in there that are not the same old thugs, corrupt, that we've had there for many years. I personally think that if we get some people that are currently living in the United States, they're enormously talented, very well educated. If we could just get some of those plus representatives of the private sector and these different political parties and set up a, a transitional panel that we may have a, a, ch- a chance of succeeding and le- leading us into the elections. And we also, when they're, cho- when they're choosing the oversight for the elections, they have to be people that are trusted by the population and not the same old corrupt people. 
Um, employment, uh, that we've, you know, sooner or later we're going to have to uh, get people working again. We did a fabulous job in Haiti in the 80s of uh, establishing uh, uh, centers, huge centers, industrial parks, we called them, that we, they made Tiffany lamps, they made U.S. baseballs, they made chips. I mean, they employed, when I was there in the 80s, there was about 20,000 people that were employed in an industrial park right outside of Port-au-Prince. Extremely modern, beautifully run, and it all collapsed when Baby Doc left. So and it's never, never regrown, really. They're, they're, they're famous now for manufacturing, or they were, but even that, they can't get electricity, they can't uh, they can't get transportation. The port is blocked about 50% of the time by thugs, e either working for the government or for the gang. So it, it's very tough. Um, so I think we need a, an international group to look into the corruption and the murder. I, that I, Somebody knows what happened to Moise. There's not a doubt in my mind. Somebody knows. I want to know who it is that knows and why aren't they coming forward. I think it's very shady. If the FBI is involved, the CIA is involved, all the police in Haiti are involved, uh, numerous people coming in and out of Miami, I, somebody's got to know. So come on, let's bite the bullet, say what happened, and try and move on. Immigration, this is a, a horrible problem. My, my uh, solution to this, and no one's... Uh, by, uh, in this apple, but I think we should set up hundreds of training centers along the border in Mexico uh, and make it part of USAID and spend millions on it and, and recognize the, the, the gap that we have in employment in the United States. We don't have enough drivers. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough uh, nurses, helpers. We don't have enough people to work in the hotels. In Maine, they've shut down half the hotels in the summer early because they didn't have enough people working in them. We, if we could train people along the border, and not necessarily to come live in Maine, uh, Maine in the States and stay there, but even if it's, it's uh, seasonal, even if we can get a hold on it so that we can actually help these people out of poverty while at the same time helping the United States of America. I don't see why we can't do that. I don't think it would, it would uh, cost a whole hell of a lot of money, but anyway, no one seems to be biting on that. Uh, <laughs> and um, the elections, yes, we do. Uh, Haiti needs elections. There's no doubt about it. I think, uh, I think elections are overblown in lots of countries. I mean, you get to elections as sort of a, a luxury when you have all kinds of other things figured out, but you need some kind of a political party, you need some kind of judiciary, you need some kind of a uh, checks and balances of which none exist in Haiti today. Okay, uh, in a recent article in the Washington Post, I pleaded with the in, in international community to stop negotiating with the current corrupt and illegitimate government. So uh, they, they did not uh, listen to me, just so you know. Okay, we're saving. Haiti contributed to the current state of affairs, so we got to help. Haiti's a neighbor. The two countries in the world that looked ahead to the U.S. first, Haiti and Liberia, both of which I served in, too rich to be poor. And I just wanted to give a, a few photographs. This is a photograph right after the earthquake of 2010. This is an entire mountainside fallen by the wayside. This is, a, this is like two days after the earthquake. This is where we put them in, tent cities, 250, 300,000 people were living in tent cities for two and a half years after the earthquake, or, or three and a half years. These are bodies lined up in the streets of Port-au-Prince, just bodies and bodies and bodies and bodies. And yet, it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning. This is the, a castle in Capacien. This is one of the most famous beaches in Haiti. Beautiful, warm, wonderful food. Uh, this is their incredibly uh, talented artisans, and they uh, exist all over the country in little hovels and holes. They produce the most beautiful things on earth, including paintings. And, of course, we have to help because of the Haitian people. Okay. I'm not sure if we should say thank you for that. <laughs> Um, that's, that's about as depressing a, uh, a profile of, of a, uh, a near neighbor as one can possibly imagine. Um, I'll ask just one question. Okay. Um, do you think there's an appetite? I mean, I've, we've both seen that the U.S. and Mexico have together endorsed the idea <clears throat> of sending some sort of relief force to Haiti. Yep. But they went to the U.N. with it. Yep. Right? Now, for, 
from, which I think was appropriate. I actually spoke this morning, knowing that we were going to do this <clears throat> presentation today, with a former official at the UN, um, who noted that there is always a lot of resistance to certain ideas from the United States. <clears throat> you pointed out that the, um, the Russian delegation to the UN basically took advantage of yesterday's hearing to lecture the US, but also the larger community about the nefarious foreign policy of the United States and how we <clears throat> were always anxious to intervene. The question my, my friend raised is, in, in going to the United States, instead of just organizing um, <clears throat> a, uh, an intervention force, were we looking for a no, or were we looking for a yes? Do you, do you think the U.S. really does want to be a part of, uh, of an international release, uh, relief effort? I really don't. I, I, you know, sadly, that's not, that's sadly, what to, me. yeah. I mean, sad to say, I don't think they do. I think because they're doing, as far as I can tell, and yeah, I, I have a lot of friends still in Washington, but they're pretty tight-lipped about this whole thing. But I think they have mine too, by the way. Yeah. I think that they're, um, they're very reluctant, certainly, to send in a for, uh, uh, any kind of military, I mean, the Marines or whomever. Uh, they don't feel that they'll, they'll be welcomed. Uh, and they, I, I don't, I'm not sure if they would or they wouldn't. I, they, they wouldn't be welcome if they took over the whole country, if they you know, invaded the country. But I, that's not my solution. That's not what I'm talking about. And I, we did it on a smaller scale very well, Brownie, uh, the, Ambassador Brown, uh, is that his name? We all called him Brownie. Uh, anyway, a, a, a great guy. Uh, he was head of, um, you know, the police uh -huh. uh, at the State Department. Anyway, um, and he was just great. And he's the one that worked out the system of getting these Haitian, uh, you know, Creole-speaking policemen recruited to help us out in Haiti. And they were, I mean, they were big and they were well trained and they were well equipped and they would come down and we had we built them barracks. Did you recruit them in the United States? Yes. So they these are Haitians who returned yes, to the country. Yes, 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 yes. They, okay. they the Haitian roots. They, they were Americans. They were fully Americans and they would come down for sometimes a month at a time. And they loved it too because they all had family down there. And you know, we treated them like as best as we possibly could because they were doing such a wonderful job for us. And I, I spent a lot of time with them. And were they typically either French or Creole speaking yes. as well? Yep. Yeah. Yep. 100%. Yeah. Let me, you know, we only have another half an hour, but I, um, I, I'd really like to see if some of you have questions for the ambassador. I have lots of questions. <laughs> so, um, um, as in and if you have any ideas, I mean, believe me, any, anything would be welcome. So... Question or two? An observation? Have any of you been to Haiti? Are any of you Haitian? No. Um, one of the things that Ambassador White and I know is that I, w I was on the other end of the island in 86 when you were in Haiti. Um, and Baby Doc was falling, and there was also a, 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 a crisis in the DR. I was then back with the, the troops and working with the UN in the mid-90s when Aristide fell the first time. And when Aristide fell the second time, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Caribbean, so Haiti was part of my portfolio. Um, uh, so I, you know, I don't have as much time on the island as you do, but in several different um, incarnations, I, yeah. was, I was back. Now, the question I have about the, uh, about the size of the, the force you're considering. Okay? Yeah. When Minusta was there, yeah. I think it, there were about 9,000. Yeah. That's right. Troops yep. of one kind or another yep. from about 15 or 20 countries, yep. including much of Latin America. Yep. Um, you don't think that would be necessary now? I or don't was it, or I, is it I, that the Haitians would object? I think the Haitians would object. The UN's got a very nasty name down there. And, you know, another whole conversation is are UN security troops effective or not? Uh, and you know, I saw them in Liberia and I saw them in. Um, in Haiti, really up close in those two countries that I've seen them, I've watched them because I'm sort of interested. And it's an interesting model. You get 20 different countries uh, under the, you know, there's, there's normally a general or uh, somebody at the top of the of the ladder, and 
the general uh, that was uh, head of the UN troops when I was there, who I adored, was a Brazilian, extremely experienced, uh, spoke fluent French, fluent English, uh, obviously fluent uh, Portuguese. But he, um, he's, you know, he said, Pam, it's, it's almost impossible to get my hands around this organization because I've got 22 different countries. Almost none of them speak Spanish or uh, I mean, a lot of them were, but they, they were from all over the place. They were, they were yeah. Chinese, when, even. When I, was, when I was working there, no. um, after, uh, after Aristide fell the second time, yeah. one of the things, some of you may find this, um, if you think about it, it will not surprise you. But I, there was also a Brazilian general. It was not the same one, but it an, an, another Brazilian general, terrific guy, very experienced. But he had 20 nationalities to deal with in terms of the troops. Many of these um, contingents had different um, uh, ROI, rules of engagement. Yes. Right? So the Uruguayans, for instance, asked to respond to some sort of a problem, would respond in one way. But the Guatemalans or um, the Pakistanis or would respond in a different way. And some of the, sometimes, you know, one country's response would be notably more harsh than the other country's response. And apparently, the, that then generated a social problem in, in some instances because the local populations were saying, why would you assign this group to help in our neighborhood? They're so violent. Um, while you have this other group in another neighborhood do you favor that other neighborhood? They're being treated much more um, carefully um, and much more gently. And, and my understanding was that the, Huge the senior military were pulling out their hair um, over how, yes. how to handle that aspect of the problem. And he also said it was like gossip when you, know, you whisper to you and you whisper to you. And when you're talking 23 different languages and none of them seem to have a common language, that the general said that he ended up putting his Brazilian troops almost in every part of the country. So at least he had somebody that he knew he wasn't playing gossip to it. Because when, when he said, you know, I want you to go out at 10 o'clock and go around the streets for three hours and report back to me and then go back out, he said it, it would come back all garbled and they would be out at, you know, midnight. And each time someone repeated it in a different language, it carried a different <laughs> message. He said it was nigh and impossible. And also, the UN system, which I did not know until he told me, that he was he was in charge of all the troops there, but the SRG, SRG as, as the, the, the representative, General's senior representative, representative yes, of the UN, uh, it was a different person. She was a woman uh, from a small country, and she really didn't have any experience whatsoever with any kind of military. But the, in order to use any kind of violence or you know show show of force, she had to say yes or no. And this used to drive him bananas because he didn't want to add someone that was not a military person and didn't understand the military repercussions of yes or no. And, and as things got more heated, the more uh, it bothered him. So anyway, it's a very it's a very difficult organization to get your arms around. Miguel, nope. But is there, the embassy is still open. It's. Yeah. They are the government. Yep. By the fact. Yep. And that we, if we want to do something, there is not an invasion, there is not a yep. military presence, we will have to deal with who is the government. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who can tell us that, right? And, and second, I don't know. Do we know how, how many uh, persons are leaving the U.S.? Yeah, 
Yeah, it was, it's interesting with the diaspora. They send, they send I think it's, it used to be 10 times more money to Haiti than all the governments, foreign governments combined. It's, it's, I mean, it's huge. It's a huge amount. And I, I would talk to them when I was ambassador. I talked to them in Miami. I talked to them in Boston. I talked to them in New York uh, to try to get them to come down. And I said, you know, j just come down and be teacher trainers. Uh, we've just opened, uh, you know, a new uh, teacher training facility. We really don't have anybody. You know, come down for three months or two months. You just come down and help us rebuild the country after the earthquake. This was in, you know, two years, three years after the earthquake. And they're like, you know, here's a check, but we are not coming down to Haiti. Uh, you know, we are in Boston. We have a great life here. My, I'm employed. My wife's employed. My kids are in school. There is no way that we're going, even for a relatively short amount of time, are we going to actually, you know, we, we're not going to give ourselves. We'll give money, but we're not going to give ourselves to Haiti, which I always found sort of disappointing, but that was the way. And about the, the embassy, there is an embassy, a huge embassy, but it's, um, I mean, not even the consular section is, is functioning. If you want a visa to come to the United States, you've got to go to the DR. Um, there is a acting acting ambassador, I guess, that uh, doesn't have really much experience in Africa, I mean in uh, Haiti. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, there's, you know, CIA is still there, FBI is still there, but people for, have been, I mean, when I was ambassador there, I was out in the country, I mean, I, I always tell young officers whether they're in AID or they're in state, you, you cannot do your job sitting behind your desk. You have got to get out and you've got to talk to the people. You can't just talk to these four or five or six or seven, you know, elite Haitians in the in the, in the private sector because as charming as they are and as wonderful as their dinner parties are, that's not Haiti in any country. And there's always that sexy elite in every country. So don't get dragged into that that. Uh, community, but you've got to go out, you've got to talk to the people, you've got to see what we're actually doing. If anything that we're doing with money from uh, USAID is actually having a real impact, get out, get out, get out. No one has got out, got out, got out uh, in Haiti the last, certainly for the last two years and probably more than that. Because just as this, you know, whole thing, you know, uh, ratcheted down, so did COVID hit. So, you know, although COVID never really hit Haiti very hard, to tell you the truth, no one knows why. They, you know, people are living like this in the slums of Haiti. It never just took, they didn't get vaccinated. I mean, um, my doctor friend, Dr. Pop, was ready for all of it. He said no one came for the vaccines because no one was, no one was getting, uh, getting call, uh, COVID, interestingly enough. But in any case, we get we do we get reporting from from Haiti. Um, I think a lot of the reporting we get, quite frankly, is from Haitian journalists. <laughs> uh, you know, but yeah, I, I one of one of the endless articles that I keep writing. Who knows who's reading them? But in any case, that doesn't discourage me. And I said it's very disturbing to me that the United States, NBC, ABC, CBS. You never hear a word about Haiti on these newscasts. I don't understand it. This is in our back door. It's two hours from Miami. And does no one care that five million people are near starvation that close to where we are? Never hear a word about it. I mean, if I want to get a word from Haiti from a news organization, either I read the New York Times or the Washington Post or... I, you know, I go on radio. NPR often has has stories on the radio, but never on TV. Not, certainly not the mass media. No. Right, that everyone, I, I, let me just say, there's, yes, Robin. Yeah, it, but it, it's sort of it's sort of galling about Ukraine. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. 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 No, 
and absolutely. I mean, how they get their money is from those two industries, the guns and the drugs. And we are deeply involved in both of that. So, yes, you're absolutely right. My, uh, when I uh, testified at the, um, in the House hearing, House and uh, relations, Foreign Relations uh, hearing, I said, why don't we start inspecting exports out of Miami into Haiti? And they said, well, you know, we're, we're only, we don't, we only, uh, our customs, customs people only inspect imports, you know, what's coming into the United States. We don't, we don't uh, care about what's going out. Well, maybe we should care. This, this is a huge uh, problem in Haiti that these guns keep coming and coming and coming. And, you know, they come in inside. They're not particularly well hidden. They come inside some cars. You know, they come in uh, there's some food crates, whatever. It, it, I don't think it would cost a whole hell of a lot of money to inspect those those um, shipments coming in, going down to Haiti, but they said, "Well, that's you know that's another whole issue. That's a customs issue." I'm like, well, yes, I know it's a customs issue. Do something about it. <clears throat> but there doesn't seem to be any political will to do a damn thing about it, for whatever reason. I, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Was was what part of what? Stomping, stomping, intending refugees at sea. Oh yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh, Mark Martelli. Somebody tried to assassinate him as well. And I, I, I don't know anything about RC? No. Like, just, just, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That was a long time ago. Well, <laughs> relatively long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. It, it. it was talked about for a little while, but then so many other disasters turned up in Haiti that they stopped talking about it. Yeah, that's right. He was an entertainer, too. Right. Yeah, I don't know. But certainly... This business of uh, you know the Coast Guard patrolling, they you know they catch Haitians you know a mile or two miles or twenty miles off uh, the coast, and then they dump them back uh, into Haiti into the you know horrific conditions that are there in Haiti today, and they make a big deal about it. They want to they want it to be seen as a deterrent for sure. You know, for, again, for those of you who are not aware of this. One of the curiosities of American immigration policy, particularly with respect to the Caribbean, um, uh, was for many years the fact that Cubans, if they could put a foot on dry land, could stay, but Haitians could not. Right? Um, now, this, this had to do with legislation. It yep. wasn't a matter of, of executive orders. <clears throat> um, but the it was, it was always the preferred approach to stop people before they got to the coast. Right? Now, further to that issue, there, there is another question I, that has come up a number of times that, that I remember coming up in, in 2004, 5, and 6 um, in the aftermath of <clears throat> um, Aristide's second fall. Yep. And that is the return of criminals to Haiti. Yep. The dilemma for the United States sometimes, and it's not just with Haiti, but the, uh, Haiti has been affected by this, is that some people will enter the United States, commit crimes, even sometimes violent crimes, serve a term in prison, and when they are done, they'll be deported to their country of origin. What I recall when I was going down as Deputy Assistant Secretary and I was talking to the, the interim Prime Minister down there about this, was that they would always say, if you don't want to effectively um, be, 
the strengthening the gangs don't return <laughs> um, to criminals. Haiti violent criminals. The problem is if you're, I don't know, we're both from Maine, if you're sitting in Bangor, Maine, is how do you explain to some American that we're going, that we've decided that someone who was never supposed to be here <laughs> and committed a crime gets to stay when they get out of jail? They were, they were illegal to start with. They committed a crime. Once they, they served the time, we want to send them back. How do you justify to a taxpayer in Maine or Vermont or West Virginia that we're not going to send someone who's committed a crime back to the country of origin? It's tough. Did this come up when you were there? No, but it's tough. I mean, I mean the whole sending back of immigrants has been, you know, the United States of America, as I'm sure you all know, has a lousy record on immigration. We don't seem to know one thing from the other <laughs> uh, about, you know, one day it's X, oh, we're going to let in 10,000 or 2,000 or whatever the number we pick out of the air, and then, oh, no, we're not, and they have to pass this test. Oh, we don't have enough judges, or we don't have enough people to, uh, you know, question them. We don't know. The paperwork's taking too long, you know, years and years. It's, it's insanity. And I don't know, and this is, if this is not a Republican or a Democrat issue, it's been going on for decades. We cannot come up with what I would call a realistic uh, policy that invites people into the United States of America. We are a country of immigrants. Why can't we figure out a way of making the ones that legitimate, have legitimate reasons for coming into the United States a path in? It's just beyond belief to me. It's so angering. Uh, yeah, don't get me wound up. Yes. Yep. to get it to the people that need it. Yeah. Almost impossible. My, in my opinion, it's almost impossible. The gangs will steal that food as fast as they can turn around. They'll sell it. It's another commodity to them, and they don't care. Believe me, you're starving over there. We don't care. I mean, that's another reason that I'm so um, pushing some kind of security situation. At least, set, at least set up safe corridors to get to the five million people that are near state starvation. If you can't do anything else. Do that. And by the way, another thing that's really, really wrong, and I think one of the reasons that we don't ever really change Haiti dramatically is that we never give enough money. We, after the earthquake, the United States of America gave $2.6 billion. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? But we're talking about 280,000 people dead. Just, to, just that problem took up a billion dollars. I mean, you've got to bury these people. You've got to find places. All the, the, all, I mean, whole mountainsides of home destroyed. And after um, the, um, the hurricane in New Orleans, Katrina, we spent $41 billion, and it's still going on, rebuilding New Orleans after that uh, hurricane. We spent $2.6 billion trying to rebuild the country. I mean, I, I told Congress, it's not enough you done this and why haven't you done that? And I said, you wait a minute. We have done tremendous things with that 2.6. We built roads. We got the airport open. We've got the port back open. We've opened a school. We can't do everything with that amount of money. And, and, and now that's a lot of money, they would say to me. It's, it does. It sounds like a lot of money. Not enough. We have another question in the back. Yes. Yep. Yep. Four people downstairs, <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, no, sorry, is this, is this thing on? 
Um, so I guess the question is, um, you know, going back beyond Minusta to MISIV, right, which is 1993, um, the UN has a long track record of military occupation, military intervention, military protection in Haiti. Use, use sort of the word you want. Um, I guess my question like is... The American military? No, no, no. Oh, no UN. Well, there's that too, right? Going all the way back to, you know, if we want to go back to 1915, we can... <laughs> um, but I guess the question about the, the particularly UN military forces, um, you said that the UN has a really bad, there, there's a bad name for the UN military oh, in yeah. Haiti. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate on why that might be. Well, first of all, because of the cholera. I mean, cholera uh, killed, uh, I think it was right around 15,000 Haitians. Uh, and, but, but thousands upon thousands upon thousands were sick with cholera, you know, incapacitated completely. Um, the other reason is that, that these soldiers went into every community in Haiti and raped the women. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of babies left behind. They did not take these babies with them, believe me, when they went back to their home country, nor took any responsibility this, for them. This is something you can assert with confidence? Oh, yes, absolutely. A thousand percent. They did the same thing in Liberia. Uh, President Sirleaf was was constantly, you know, trying to get a handle on it. You know, if you know, if someone was accused of raping a, a Liberian or even a Haitian, which would, you know, would almost never were they, you know, were they, uh, you know, would, would, would the population say, you know, that it's that man, it's that man, because then they would bring shame on themselves. But in, and they tended to do a little more of it in Liberia than they ever did in Haiti. But yeah, you know, they would send the, the, that person out of the country. But that was it. It wasn't like well, you have to, you know, your country has to give this woman, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, money to take care of this child left behind. So, the rapes, the 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 absolute racism of some of the people uh, that, you know, they would admit that they hated blacks and didn't want to be around blacks and you know, filthy this and filthy that. So between the racism and the rapes and the cholera, they did not have a real good reputation. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Yes, Alex. So just to follow up on that, I'm wondering, so you're sort of advocating for another form of intervention led by the U.S. or U.S. police force or U.S. troops. And I'm wondering if we're getting ourselves into the same kind of dangerous situation where you could potentially have people that are also racist or might also commit similar atrocities in this kind of situation where people are incredibly vulnerable. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, it, you're right. It, 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 there is no good solution, God knows, to this horror. There is just none. I mean, I, I, I wake up at night trying to think, well, what about this? Sort of think out of the box, think out of the box, think out of the carton. But, you know, there's, there's just no easy solutions. But I, I think one of the reasons that these recruited uh, Haitian descent policemen from Miami and the NYPD work so well is that they spoke the language. I mean, you, I, mean I speak fluent French. I, I couldn't speak to 90% of the, the Haitian population. I had to learn Creole on the spot while I was down there in order to give a speech that anyone would listen to. I hate that State Department doesn't do better at local languages because we tend to think, oh, just speak French. Well, that's not going to help. And, you know, it, it, and, and by the way, in, in East Africa, speaking English didn't help either. If you didn't speak Swahili, forget it. You, I couldn't give a speech to anyone on that coast either. So anyway, that's another one of my pet peeves. But um, I think if you, if you stick with people who really know, and when, they, when, the, when troops finally came into Liberia to really help stop the civil war, civil war there, 90% of them, uh, in the end were Nigerian, and that worked so much better because they were African and they understood culturally what was going on, et cetera. And I think if we can at least start from that point of having some cultural understanding, it might have a chance of working. If I may just add, um, because I've been doing a little work on the same subject, and, and, and Ambassador White and I have been talking about it, I, I've been in, in touch with some folks in Washington and elsewhere as well as this morning with someone who used to be at the UN. Um, I actually don't think if the, the acting president, the prime minister of, of Haiti has said, we need a force. Mexico and the U.S. had said, have endorsed that idea. And so is the secretary general of the U.N. And Canada. And, and, but until the, the Security Council says, yeah. okay, then it, it can't really be organized and dispatched, even if it's not technically a U.N. force. Now, all of that being the case, I asked someone uh, 
in D.C. if we were ready to send troops or police or whatever? And the answer was, we probably would like to see other people send the bodies, in part because of the possibility that there would be a strong reaction against a U.S. force. Um, uh, now, that doesn't, that doesn't address all of the concerns, but, but the, the idea that, that was floated to me was, well, you may have USAID on the ground, get the embassy back up and operating, um, encourage others, underwrite a lot of the expenses for other, uh, other national contingents, but not actually lead the, the, the effort ourselves. Is that going to happen? I don't know. But that's, that was one readout I got from someone in D.C. Sure. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and, and not just there. Because the, the I mean, it's very interesting. I, 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 had some, I had someone push back telling me, no, no, no. Because I said most countries in Latin America have a certain aversion to intervention. What I might have said that would have been more correct is they have a certain aversion to U.S. intervention <laughs> in the Americas. Right? So we, we have, this is our history. You know, we have intervened in a number of places, including Haiti. When I was there in the mid-90s, there were several thousand American troops there, along with contingents from many other countries. But ours was the biggest the most well-armed, and since we were paying for a lot of it, um, to use the, an old-fashioned expression, we were the ones that got to cut the cake. Right? <laughs> the, the, um, the thinking, as I understand it now, and I, I don't know what you've heard, is, you know, if, if we want this to work and we don't want there to be too much resistance to a relief force, maybe we don't populate it with American troops. And I think that became really popular under Obama, you know, militarily speaking. It was always a coalition. It was always yeah. an and, international. And the leaning from behind phrasing was kind of unfortunate. Yeah. But I know what he was talking Yeah, yeah, about. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, we have. Yeah, I just had a question. So on the slideshow, it said, like, doing nothing is killing Haitian. So what is something, like, I'm a dude sophomore. I have no intentions of visiting Haiti anytime soon. What is something that, like, myself or my classmates here, like, in the next week, month, or year can do and sort of, like, being proactive and, you know, learning more or just, like, what, what's something that we could do as students? Yeah, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a very good question. It, 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 it Truthfully, it, and I never really um, recognized this because I haven't, never did as much of it as I've done in the last couple of years, but, you know, writing to your congressman, writing to newspapers, writing your thoughts, I mean, anything that gets publicly acknowledged that, you know, Haiti matters, and I don't care how you phrase it particularly, but I, I think it does sort of, you know, the, the, all those small pieces add up to something. So, you know, if you, if, if you think what we're not doing in Haiti, we're not doing very much right now in Haiti, is not the right way forward, then express it in one way or the other, a written form or any other way that you feel like you can. I, I don't think, even, you know, it used to be, well, give, give uh, you know, I, I know lots of um, really great charities in Haiti that would, you know, like your money, but I, I think it's more important to get our voices heard. One could even write to one's congressman. Yes. And say, you know, of course, um, this is a tragedy um, in the neighborhood, and um, we should be doing more. I mean, we're doing some, but if, if you have no sort of governmental structures, um, then the chances of, say, our food aid um, getting to the hungry go way down. Yeah. Yes. I remember Congressman Hill, and I don't think he's related by any group of troops. I think it's about the same right here. Got amazing support from the people who are so far. Paul Farmer was one of my closest friends. I could, I almost cry just mentioning his name. He was 66 years old and died oh, last year. And he was probably as near as a saint as I will ever meet in my life. Uh, Paul Farmer. Paul I Farmer. All read his book on Haiti. Yeah, Mountains After Mountains. Anyway, he's. Uh, uh, anyway, it, and he would always say to me, "I, we, I had, you know, he was in my house. I was in his house. We would 
drank rum at his hospitals in Haiti, and uh, you know he said, "Don't get don't get dragged down by the elites, the political elites, the private sector elites. You know, come out here, Pam, where we can we deal with the real Haitians." And he would say, "Let's do rounds at the hospital at six o'clock," and I'd be there at six. He'd been there for two hours already. I mean, he, a remarkable man. Another couple of questions, I think. We have time. Latin America's obvious, like, understandable aversion for American yes. immigration. Yes. Do you think that other Latin American countries might have any desire or, like, a method of us incentivizing them playing a role in helping Haiti? Yeah, I think so that's a great, that? great question. And, and, we, and I'm, ho I'm hoping. We are. I mean, yeah. the next door neighbor that can, you know. I, 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 I'm hoping that we can find somebody, but I think it's a great question because I think they would be much more easily tolerated. I mean, the Brazilians had a really good reputation in Haiti. Yeah, and they were good, really good. So, Even yes. Some of the countries that, with which we were not getting along in earlier um, iterations of this, even some of the countries with which we were not getting along, got to Haiti and worked with some of our folks on the ground. For instance, right after the big earthquake, I know that Venezuelans, I was the ambassador in Venezuela, um, Basically, we spent a lot of time spitting on each other's shoes. We were, <laughs> we were not getting along, and I got kicked out, um, mm -hmm. uh, just for the record. Um, but they were helping, and the Cubans were helping. And I remember being called in for some proximate reason by the, the foreign ministry. That's what they say when they want to scold you for something. But the real reason was <laughs> before the scolding, we sat down and had a long meeting on ways we could work together in Haiti. Um, so Latin Americans care about Haiti, but there's, there's got to be a kind of a convening nation. Um, hi, so I'm interested in both of y'all's perspectives on international organizations. So last year, in, in the sense, so last year I did some research on um, the international like NGOs and all those types of groups that went into Haiti after the earthquake. And from that I learned that there was um, there were a lot of problems associated with that as well, such as like squandering money with different groups, different groups like repeating the same tasks over and over, and over again just because of a like, lack of planning and stuff like that. Um, so generally, I was wondering, what do you think should have been done in that sense um, to better, I guess, formulate a plan for helping Haiti from an inter international perspective? Yeah, it's a very, very good question, and it, and it, you know, it's true that a lot of money was wasted. But believe me, a lot of money was wasted in New Orleans too. I mean, this is, wasn't necessarily a Haitian problem or a, a Liberian problem or whatever country we're in problem. Money does get wasted. There is no two ways. I've seen it over and over and over in my career. Here's what what the the best example of how it should run and almost never is run is that if the government itself is a not corrupt and B, takes the, the interest in donor coordination. And when I was in uh, Liberia, President Sirleaf, who was a, you know, a Harvard graduate, had you know, impeccable credentials, had worked for the World Bank. I mean, she really, really knew what she was doing, had been preparing to be president of Liberia for you know, a decade. Anyway, she was the lead donor coordinator. And she got us all around a table. And there was a lot of money coming into Liberia after the Civil War also. My budget at AID was about $500 million a year. But um, she sat us all around a table every other week, every two weeks. It was probably 40 of us around the table from major, major NGOs, every major embassy. I was always there. The American ambassador was always there. Anyway, and she, she had a master list of what she wanted each of us to accomplish and where in the country. She had a major, she had a master map. So it, it wasn't like we were building schools, you know, 20 donors were building schools in the same in the same city. She said, you know, get out of that city if you and and if you don't like it, leave. Very strict. So, you know, I'm talking to you, you're not talking to me. And so we had a nationwide donor coordinated effort that the government led. And the Minister of Finance and I, a brilliant guy, also, uh, I think he was a graduate of, um, of uh, Yale. But anyway, he, the Liberian, American Liberian, uh, and unlike Haitians, lots of Liberians who had, uh, American Liberians went back right after the war and, and 
and helped out for two or three years. Anyway, he and I looked at the Millennium Challenge, um, uh, what you needed to do to get the big, big bucks from the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the MCC, and uh, he and I realized that if we changed certain government, we could start meeting those criteria. And we worked two years on it, setting them up, demanding. We had, he and I co-chaired, we had all the ministers in every other week. We said, these are the that, these are the criteria you need to meet. In two years, we got the MCC um, uh, approved in Washington. I did the same thing in Haiti. I had the prime minister, oh yeah, Pam, you know, yeah, you're right. We can do this, we can do this. Listen, right, Liberia could do it after, you know, 10 years of civil war. The country was completely destroyed. You can do it in Haiti, you can do it. And, oh yeah, yeah, we can, we can. I don't think he ever had a meeting. We never was any donor coordination. And you know why countries don't mind uh, chaos and donor coordination? Because having, having uh, all right, I'm going to buy 100 blankets, you're going to buy 100 blankets, you're going to buy 100 blankets. And you can show proof that 100 blankets were, bought, were actually purchased. But the rest of that money <laughs> floats into the ether. And so donor coordination often for corrupt go governments is the last thing that they really want. And there was not good donor coordination, I will tell you right now, in Haiti after the earthquake. And I'll just, just give you just you know, one minute. In, when I was, in, I was the deputy chief of mission in Bolivia, which is, was then at least in, in me, um, the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere after Haiti. And <clears throat> there were any number of of other governments and very active NGOs there. And I think we had, at least for a time, more success than, than we saw in some other places. But it was very specifically because there, was, um, there were regular meetings for both the embassies and the NGOs and frequently together. And those meetings were always attended by senior people from the, the host government. There you go. Uh, I mean, that's. That, that was the key. To me, that's the key. Um, so that people would say, yes, yes, yes. Same, even on counter narcotics. Yes, this is important. And you can do that. Why don't you do this over here? So that we're not spending, uh, we're, not, we're, we're not encouraging redundancy where, where, where that doesn't make sense. Yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Do you really believe the United States? It's, it's hard to hear you from up here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Do you really believe the United States care about Haiti? Do we think the U.S. cares about Haiti? After the earthquake, over 50% of Americans gave something to the efforts in Haiti. So, yes, I think America cares about Haiti. I, I, I don't see a lot of, um, I don't see a lot of uh, evidence that this administration... Yeah, but I'm not talking about American people. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, I knew you weren't. I, I'm talking about the policies, you know, the United States has been putting a place. Yes, I, 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 I got to say, I personally am quite disappointed in the U.S. government's reaction to what's going on in Haiti, because Haiti has been a spiraling down. I've been writing about this for two years, and it's not gotten better, it's gotten worse. And every time we do nothing, it gets worse and worse and worse. Clear. Last one, I think, because the class is getting over. Um, are there any... Are there any uh, solutions that the Haitian people are pushing towards or that groups within the Haitians are pushing towards, I guess? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 they, they do not like Henri, who is the, the prime minister, the current prime minister, who is the only guy that's speaking for the Haitians, and they don't like him, they don't trust him. So they are, they are asking to have a transitional government, but you know, I don't think that they've put up candidates. Like, who, what would that look like? But they know what they've got now is is not a solution to their problem. 